Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This is uh, beginning of April here. Hope folks are doing well and being safe. We've got quite a bit to cover today, so let's hop in. Uh, community contributor IDE OX90 added a new module exploiting a vulnerability affecting versions of Apache Solar 8.3.0 and prior. Via Solar's custom velocity template functionality, this module sends a specially crafted HTTP post to set the target's params resource loader enable setting to true, followed with a custom velocity template to gain remote code execution. Uh, it's pretty cool, and we will have a demo of this. Our own Spencer McIntyre provided a new module targeting Microsoft's SharePoint collaboration software. Vulnerable versions of SharePoint will accept specially crafted XOML data from this module sent via the workflows functionality to gain C Sharp code execution on the target. Also very cool, and we will also have a demo of this. Community contributor Pedrib added a new module targeting vulnerable versions of the IBM planning analytics application, allowing an attacker to gain unauthenticated remote code execution. Starting with a configuration overwrite, this module enables authentication via CAM, an IBM proprietary auth mechanism, and then interacts with the target to gain a forged admin authentication, wrapping up the attack with abuse of the TM1 scripting mechanism to gain command and code execution on the target. Pretty snazzy. Community contributor Cyrus Ant provided a new module targeting the Horde data API, which is bundled with software such as Horde Groupware Webmail Edition Suite. Versions 2.1.4 and prior of the data API fail to properly escape strings on a CSV import operation, providing a path for this module to send the PHP payload via post request and have it execute on the target. Nice. Community contributor Hold On A Sec created a new module which exploits a deserialization vulnerability in .NET Nuke, a .NET based web content management system and web application framework, affecting versions 5.0.0 through 9.3.0 RC achieving remote code execution via cookie deserialization on load of a custom error page. Neat. And community contributor Nicholas Stark added a new module targeting vulnerable D-Link EWL 2600 Wi-Fi access point devices. Vulnerable devices will accept a payload from this new module via an unsanitized post request parameter to the restore configuration functionality endpoint, leading to command end code execution on the target. Like that. Uh, Nicholas also provided a new denial of service module targeting the cable haunt vulnerability found in some cable modems. Successful execution of this new module will disrupt the current operations of vulnerable target devices. Contributor Hoodie provided a new Privesk module targeting VMware Fusion on Mac OS. Affected Fusion versions 10.1.3 through 11.5.3 inclusive contain improper use of set UID binaries allowing execution of an attacker controlled binary via the open VMware US arbitrator service. It should be noted that VMware did issue a patch in version 11.5.3, which is the current Fusion version for macOS, but, the vulnerable, but that version is still vulnerable to this attack. And we'll have a demo of this. In rounding out our list here, community contributor Blue Sentinel Sec provided a new post module for installing an embedded Python 3 interpreter on Windows targets, perfect for those who would like access to a lightweight Python interpreter on their Windows target. Additionally, administrative, administrative privileges are not required and the installation occurs without any user interaction on the target, which is pretty slick. And we'll have a demo of this. And as usual, a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about the, outside of the modules. Uh, community contributor CN Cali team added the ability to manage local and domain Windows users and groups via the Windows API over Meterpreter. Also updating a few modules to replace OS command execution with calls to the new code. Very cool. Our own Spencer McIntyre add, added limits to the size of payload string options in order to ensure they will fit within defined buffers, which should make behavior more uh, deterministic and better. Great. Our own Brent Cook added some of the dependencies, updated some of the dependencies for the compiled interpreter with a side effect na of now properly reporting Catalina on Catalina Mac OS targets. Nice. Community contributor Oxalus updated a few scripts in the tools directory, such as pattern create, pattern offset, and make IP less to reduce their runtime by almost two orders of magnitude in some cases, which is pretty amazing. Our own Adam Galway added the ability to profile specific sections of code for CPU or memory usage. Very cool. 
Adam also further optimized the time to return from unknown command from one second to half a second. So saving more time there. Community, uh, sorry, contributor B. Coles added a reverse shell for TCLSH, aka Tickle Shell, which is a simple shell containing Tickle Interpreter. Very cool. Uh, contributors Hoodie, TechWiz123, and Exigent Midnight all put in effort to improve and add module documentations this go around, uh, which is great. Really appreciate that. And some bug fixes. We've got a few bug fixes. Our own Adam Kamek fixed a bug in the Redis unauth exec check method so that it now runs as expected instead of reporting that check is not supported. Appreciate that. Our own Zero Steiner updated the Rex sockets get local name method so that interpreter reverse HTTP and HTTPS transports as well as SOX5 proxying now work as expected. Good stuff. Contributor Tim Wright fixed the latent stability issue that could lead to crashes when reconnecting to interpreter payloads. Good stuff. Community contributor Srikwit updated the Linux Prevesk example module in order to correctly identify it as a local exploit instead of a remote one. Community contributor Debbie Frank fixed the regular expression used in the Cisco DCNM upload 2019 module, allowing it to find directories with, within paths which contain a space. Community contributor Hoodie updated the issue finder doc script to ignore compiled Python and internal, py yeah, internal Python files. And community contributor Mehmet Ince resolved the method name collision when both the MSF exploit remote HTTP client and FTP modules are used within the same module. And rounding out our list here, contributor Green M renamed and, and deprecated the Redis unauth exec module to become Redis replication command exe. Good stuff there. And uh, a bonus slide. We've had a bonus slide for a few weeks now. Uh, we'd like to share some more exciting news about uh, their attacker knowledge base web app offering. If you haven't heard, Attacker KB is a new resource to highlight hacker community knowledge on which bones matter most and why. If you're interested in participating in the beta, Caitlin put up an informative blog post linked there in the slide which, with more details about Attacker KB and info on how to sign up if you'd like to throw your hat in the ring for beta participation. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blogs at blog.rapid7.com. And we do appreciate all of y'all who make Metasploit better through your contributions to the projects. Thank you for that. And with that, time for demos. VMware right. Fusion Privilege Escalation. Uh, this is, I think, about a, about a two minute video, um, but should show the privilege escalation vulnerability being exploited uh, that's present in the current offering of VMware's fusion for mac os yeah one thing to note is you need uh, of course a, a local session to start with so starting up a uh, just a simple netcat reverse shell um, just to give a local session back into the metasploit um, of course since this is a local privilege escalation it needs to pivot over an existing session um, this exploits us a secondary set uid script that was already um, left behind in the um, in the environment that can basically load and run code so this is basically just using that script that exists on your mac mm -hmm. um, as you continue on you can see that uh, we basically raised the privilege at level loaded a interpreter session and um, started the new shell um, yeah pretty straightforward um, i think basically kind of the, the lesson learned here is um, that one set UID scripts are not great, and uh, two, um, usually where there's smoke, when there's fire. So usually when vendors you know fix one bug, they should probably look at the code and find the other versions that are also lurking elsewhere. Oh, well said. All righty, move on to the Solar Velocity Template RCE. So uh, for those of you who may not know, this is a product uh, solar for uh, enterprise search engine. Uh, this came in, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago, and we finally managed to bring it across the line. It was kind of a long process. Um, in this particular case, uh, the exploit, uh, you, you can see you don't need a username or password to this. Uh, it's a unauthenticated RCE in this particular release. I might be able to spell check occasionally. Um, but So we go ahead and we run it. This does take a little bit longer, but we just get a shell here. And when I run who am I, after a little while, maybe.
There we go. Hey. <laughs> okay. Super cool. Awesome. And rolling, rolling with Brendan some more. Uh, we've got the SharePoint workflows, XOML, remote code execution. We actually have the original author here with us that's going to present this one. All Hello. Right. Is it Mr. Spencer McIntyre? Yeah, thanks for recording this one, Brendan. Uh, but yeah, this was a really interesting uh, vulnerability. So uh, what it is is an authenticated RCE in SharePoint that basically there is an endpoint that can be utilized uh, to create basically rules within SharePoint. And as part of the request that can get uploaded into that, uh, gets written out to a C-sharp file, which has been compiled. And so this vulnerability escapes out of that C-sharp file to be able to execute additional code within there. And so what we see here is it's going through and running uh, the operating system commands uh, to upload one of our command stagers, which allows us to get a full-blown interpreter shell. So this module has a couple of different options. I believe it can either drop the binary to disk, which is what we see in this example here, or it can use a, a PowerShell option to try to not touch anything on disk. But if PowerShell isn't available, you might want to use the first option. So we have a couple of here. Uh, there's also a check method that effectively tries to execute that vulnerable endpoint and analyzes the C Sharp compiler error message to be able to identify whether or not the vulnerability is present or if it has been patched. Super cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. All right, and installing Python for Windows targets. Mr. Waters. Certainly. So this uh, came in, and we honestly talked a little bit about this because it's it's kind of a fun little post module. It installs an embedded version of Python to a remote machine. And as some people may already know, we, we do have a Python implementation uh, that runs purely inside memory. So it's, it's much more stealthy than, for example, this, which we were uploading a file and running it. But one of the things is, is that like most of the world, we have not kept up. And the last time I checked, we were doing uh, Python 2.7. I think this is a really neat addition because it lets us pick what version of Python we'd like to put on the remote machine, which gives a couple more options. So in this case, we're using Python 3, as you can see. Um, and so I think that's kind of neat. We put it into a, a hidden uh, directory, as you can see, uh, .python. Um, and we go ahead and install Python so that we have uh, Python on the remote machine if we wanted to use it. So there we go. I'm gonna try and get a shell here. I hope. And we drop back into the shell. And now because I'm inside the shell and the in inside the directory with Python or one directory above, I can invoke uh, Python and run a Python script. That's really cool. Yeah. Obviously, this leaves behind an artifact, right? <laughs> Which is Python. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can set the option of remove it. So okay, that's cool. It'll, it'll, it, you can set the option to clean itself up. Hmm, nice. That was way faster than I thought installing Python should take. That was kind of amazing. This is an embedded release of Python that they're using. So it's, it's a stripped down version. So it's very small. Oh, okay, cool. I hadn't heard of that. Nice. Efficiency. And this one also does not require administrator privileges, nor does it require any interaction by on the part of the user with, uh, what the target sounds like. Uh, correct. Uh, in fact, I was basically, I was a regular user when I was, when I was running that. Nice. Super cool. Thank you, Brendan. Excellent.